Welcome back, podcast fans. I'm your host, Annette Hines, and this is Parenting Impossible with Michelle Mercier. Mercier? Mercier, either one. Mercier. I answer to whichever. Okay. <laughs> I, I married it. That. I'm like, oh, I know how to say this. And then I'm on, on air and I'm like, oh crap, I don't know how to say this. <laughs> so it's all good. Michelle, Michelle and I were having a lot of fun and a few laughs before we <laughs> hit the record button. So don't mind us being a little giggly here, but I have to tell you about Michelle. She's talking today about a subject near and dear to my heart. And that is caregiver balance, especially around entrepreneurialism. And that's a mouthful to say, but all that means is people who are in business for themselves and are, you know, somewhat creative with that business. She's a business growth consultant, uh, trained in dare to lead. And she had a podcast that is on pause, but she's got 150 plus episodes there for you to listen to. And it's called the resilient entrepreneur was doing amazingly well, but life gets in the way. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Exactly. Life gets in the way. So Michelle, um, as a business growth consultant and a busy entrepreneur, you landed on my show because your family has a connection to the disability community. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So we have, it's, it's really funny. I was just speaking to somebody the other day about the fact that since September, this is our longest stretch as a family in the last 10 years where we, I know, I don't even want to curse it. Right. But I have to say it. Cause it's like, I want to celebrate it at the same time as like, just yes. not jinx myself. <laughs> Don't jinx yourself, <laughs> knock on, knocking on wood on the desk. But, you know, it's it's our longest stretch in a little over 10 years of not being in and out of hospitals, dealing with specialists and dealing with crisis, to be mm. to be blunt, like just all out crisis in our family. So it's, it's definitely taken some getting used to in a good way. Um, but both of my children were born medically complicated. Um, the first was born aspirating, not, we didn't know it at the time, but about a year and a half in, we developed, um, we just, we discovered that he was aspirating into his lungs. He had severe GI issues. Um, he had a seizure, um, like not a, not a, from a high fever seizure, an actual genuine mm -hmm. seizure. So we ended up with neurological workups, you know, you name it, we probably saw it. Um, yeah. and then a couple of years after that, my second one was born and, you know, I, I had, I had hopes that maybe we wouldn't, you know, go down the same path, but you know, the universe works in mysterious ways. Um, and he was born with a lot of heart issues. He was born with laryngeal malaysia, which is a floppy larynx. So he was having blue spells, you know, lots of GI issues, the same. And then, you know, the two of them just continued to become number one, these two resilient and amazing kids, because mm. you know you have to be when you're a child. And I'm sure lots of your listeners know, like if you're in and out of specialists, in and out of doctors and you're little, like it's a lot. My husband and I did yeah. a lot to make it, you know, as fun and as like seamless as possible, you know, but it produces really resilient kids. And then, you know, flash forward through the years, we've, we've gone through multiple neuropsychs with both kids. And my youngest is actually autism level one and ADHD. Um, with a lot of anxiety as well. And then my oldest actually within the last two years, um, well, he's, he was diagnosed as pan as, um, ADHD a couple of years ago, but then the last two years also was diagnosed with something called pandas, mm -hmm. which stands for a very long acronym or a very long phrase that I'm not going to say. Um, but essentially what it means is when strep is in your body and it goes undetected because there's no physical symptoms. So when he yeah. gets strep, he has zero physical symptoms. Um, but it actually triggers an autoimmune response in your brain, which results in things like OCD, um, writing challenges, food aversions, you know, high levels of anxiety, you know, all sorts of different things. So we've dealt with just a whole spectrum of things. And the whole time I've been over here kind of chugging along, building my business. Um, I worked 10 years, almost 10 years in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. before becoming an entrepreneur. And, you know, I'm very grateful that I was able to take the leap to entrepreneurship because I don't know how I would have been able to maneuver a job in tech, especially because it's so 24 yeah. seven when we were always in and out of hospitals and, and dealing with everything. So, but yes. we've learned, we've learned a lot as a family. And I mean, my kids are pretty like knock on wood again, like they're very chill, very resilient, very great kids. And I think mm -hmm. it's a testament to what they've been through and what we've all been through over here. Awesome. 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 Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> wow. I, so first of all, the first thing I do want to talk to you about is resilience and what that yeah, looks like in course. caregivers, especially. <clears throat> but yeah. um, pandas is, yeah. and we could have a whole session on just yes, on this could. or a series yeah. even. Yeah. Because it is one of those diagnoses that are challenged and challenging. And yep. um, I've met with many families who have had difficulty with their medical providers yes. around pandas, yes. around Lyme, around what yeah. my daughter had, a mitochondrial defect, just oh, a lot yeah. of different things. And so I'm sure that you have a host of tips around how to be the educator as the yes. caregiver when it comes yes. to, you know, working with your, your team. Yeah. You know, I just, well, I, I was very fortunate in the fact that our pediatrician's daughter actually has pans. So mm -hmm. she was kind of already clued in a little bit with that, but I was the one who said, this is pandas when I brought him in because he had already, he had always been a strep kid, oh, but it yeah. was like out of left field came vocal tics and all of these things that, you know, there was no, there was no direct cause for. And mm -hmm. also the thing is, is for anybody who doesn't, you know, quote unquote, believe in it, you know, if the thing that made me a true believer was once we found the correct antibiotic to treat the strep within 48 hours, his vocal tics were gone. Yeah. And it was, it was an amazing thing to watch because like, this is a noise. Like if you're not familiar with vocal tics, it's a noise that he's making over and over again, multiple times a minute, you know, 50 times a minute or something like that, like over and over again, he, it's compulsive. He can't, he can't help it. Mm -hmm. Um, but then all of a sudden within the right meds, bam, gone. So don't tell me it's not strep. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and also, you know, he also had two years ago, he had high levels and we ended up a tip for this is that he doesn't have tonsils because he had strep a lot. So they took his tonsils out. So he doesn't swab positive ever. Mm. So what they had to do was look for the, the markers in his blood to see if his body was fighting strep. And they actually mm. did that for strep and walking pneumonia. And he came back incredibly elevated for both. So he wow. had both of those, his body was fighting both of those with again, no physical no symptoms, symptoms. Mm -hmm. all mental symptoms. And so we had to kind of, it took us about four or five months to get the right antibiotics for the right things to, you know, bring him down. And there's also proof in the fact that he had his neuropsych on the tail end of a, of a flare. And it was basically like, he needs OT stat. Like he needs OT, like yesterday he's failing in all these ways because it impacts his ability to write and his ability to translate thoughts um, versus when I actually got in for the OT eval, the OT person was like, why is this kid here? <laughs> he mm -hmm. doesn't need OT, you know? And it was because the flare was done and we had, we had kind of, you know, figured out the right meds and everything like that. So, I mean, I became a true believer that I'm not a doctor, right? I, I get that there's yeah. skepticism around that, but the data is pointing towards this in a mm -hmm. lot of big ways. So, and there's, and there's no other description of why from overnight these kids change like this mm -hmm. um, without some sort of pathogen or something in your system to do it. So my, I mean, my main tip just to come full circle on your original question is that, you know, lean on organizations like that are out there, the nonprofits that are out there. Like there's, um, I can't remember the, the name one, maybe you know it, it's, um, but they have an entire downloadable guide for, for schools on pandas. And I literally download it and I hand it to the school and, I, and, it, and it has a section for the nurse. It has a section for the guidance counselor. It has a nice. section for the teachers because they don't often know what to look for to help, help spot a flare, or they don't know what, you know, they may just think Jack's picky, but really he's got OCD. So like, yeah. he's not just like, I want to sit in the seat because it's cool. Like I want to sit in the seat because I have to sit in the seat. You know, there's different levels of it. And I, but I do think it takes, it's almost a full-time job just to advocate and teach mm -hmm. and educate for all of that. Like it, it takes a lot of strength to be able to do that. So kudos to any other moms out there doing it too. Yeah. Let's switch gears and talk about that strength and yeah. resilience. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned overcoming adversity and building resilience, but sometimes we're not really overcoming. We're just living in it. Yes. Right. Yes, we are. Yeah. So how do we build resilience? What yeah. is resilience? What does resilience mean to you? Let's start with that. 
Yeah. I mean, I think, so it's interesting because when I was doing my podcast, Resilient Entrepreneur, I looked at the definition of resilience a lot. Um, and it was like this like thing about like the able, ability to like bounce back. Right. Like, and I'm like, okay, but sometimes like, it's not that quick friends. Like, no, I think, you know, my definition of resilience is the ability to kind of continue to move through things and feel all of the emotions and continue to move forward. Right. Like that's when I look at resilience, like, you're going to have to feel all the feels, like no matter what they are. I think that's mm. one thing when I talk to clients and I talk to parents, like you can only push that stuff down for so long or else it's coming for you. So, you know, what I've made a, a habit of over the last decade is really making sure that I'm conscious of my emotions. I don't let them drive the bus all the time, yeah. right? Because they can't, because I don't have a choice. I need to function. Um but I do acknowledge them all. So I think with rebuilding resilience, the more resilient you get, the more you're able to acknowledge them and to keep moving through them, not mm -hmm. past them, not shoving them down, not ignoring them, but move through them, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love that. Feel the feels. So mm -hmm. um, building resilience is just like building a muscle. Yes, it is. You know, yeah. it's not something that you have or that's been gifted to you. No. It's a bit of work to get there, in my opinion. Yes. Absolutely. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's the thing is like, there's not much, I don't want to, I don't want to say this again. I feel like this entire episode is just me jinxing myself, but <laughs> I, um, like there's not much that shakes us as a family here, like mm -hmm. to the core. Um, like when COVID hit, I joke around like, yes, was it hard? Absolutely. But to our family, we were all kind of like, meh, another fucking thing. Like, <laughs> part of my French, but like, you know, because I think it is, it is a muscle and it does require you, unfortunately, to learn the hard way on how to go through things. And, but every time you get hit, you come up a little stronger. And I know that sounds really cheesy and really hard to hear, especially if you're in the middle of the adversity. Um, but to me, there's always, there always has to be a reason for the bad shit to happen. Like there, there just has to be, it's non-negotiable with me. There has to be a positive outcome to the negative stuff. Yeah. It, it's, it's this search that we have as human beings for meaning in everything yeah. in our life. Yeah. It's not that it's not hard. Like you said, no, 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 but it's absolutely hard. Yeah. We, we can get something out of every struggle. You know, mm -hmm. I lost my daughter. She died. That sucked. Yeah. It's yeah. like an Absolutely. understatement. And it did rock our family to the core. Yeah, I'm sure. But at the same time, what came from that? You know, right. Right. That it's not meaningless that she died. It's not meaningless no, that she no. was here. Everything that we've experienced, COVID being one of them. Yeah. It all brings us to that next place and Absolutely. helps us learn add tools to our tool chest, discover things about ourselves we never knew. <laughs> yes, that you know, part, that like, itself is like an entire episode. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, you know, like that fight to get toilet paper and yeah. hand sanitizer <laughs> it was something otherworldly. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Like, my family needs this. <laughs> yeah, like nothing um, like a severe fight or flight to make it rethink your life. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, my experience with entrepreneur, yeah, the entrepreneurialism. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I've always had that bug, but always wanted to feel safety in having a job, but it was so hard, you know, yeah. Yeah. nobody wanted to hire this girl, like right. not in the traditional right market right. different yeah when I first got out of law school I basically had Elizabeth like three seconds later so here I was newly married uh you know nine week preemie who was four pounds when I brought her home after being in the NICU wow. and we didn't even know then the extent of everything that was going on with her and yeah like there was there's no daycare for that you know yeah. there's no yeah. jobs out there who are like Shh, work when you can, you yeah, know, no, and especially that. not in our industry. And so I started out basically part-time in my own little practice in a tiny little office, like many women and men who are yeah. in my situation Yeah, and just doing what I could. Then 
I sought the safety of, you know, a, a, another firm, a job with a paycheck and benefits and, you know, all of that. Yeah. And that just didn't last. I mean, I think I had four jobs in three years or something like that, or, you know, three jobs in four years, maybe it was, it was like, you know, round peg, square hole, square yeah. peg, round hole. Yeah. It, they, they get it, but they don't get it. And, right. um, it's like, why aren't you here at five o'clock at night? Well, cause I need to go make dinner and read my kids a story and do bedtime yeah. and all yeah. of those things. They're just important and, and I'll get the work done. Um, so my resilience story is that after multiple failures, which really shook me up because I'm sure I thought I was just very like, I'm a, I'm really excellent at what I do, but it was all this other stuff that kept getting in the way. I started special needs law group and that was, you know, nearly 12 years ago and I never looked back. Good. Is it hard running my own business? Oh my yes. freaking God. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. And do I hate it sometimes? Hell yes. I yeah. hate bookkeeping and I yes. hate taxes yes. and I hate sometimes dealing with employees. I'm just going to be honest. I love my employees yep. as people, but dealing with all it's of their lot. crap, it's you know, lot. like this one needs a half a day and that one. And it's like, you know what? I went into this business to just work with families yeah. and I want to do that. That's my core. I don't want to like right. deal with the other stuff running business all the time. So I totally get that this entrepreneurialism is not for everybody, but it has been such a solution and such a godsend for many people in our situations. Mm -hmm. And for me, the resilient piece of it was discovering that. Yeah and doing what I can. So when you went into business for yourself, what was your turning point? What was that moment when you said, oh, I have to just do something different? Yeah. So the, when I was working in corporate, I went on maternity leave with my second and I had had him and there were a lot of complications and we had literally just gotten him medically cleared to go to a daycare. Cause like you said, like I couldn't send him to daycare and be like, he might turn blue. Is that cool with you guys? Cool. Like liability. Oh my God. You know, and like you have never experienced this people. You have no idea the terror no. of watching your baby's lips or your little one's no, lips. No, you know, and, and, and it's like, I, but we got him to a point where he could go. Right. And, but then I got the call that my business unit was sold. So then <laughs> I lost my job and I was like, oh Cool, cool. That's Great. Cool. Um, and honestly, like I always, I always tell people too, like I could, for some reason I could deal with all the medical stuff and all the stuff with my kids and everything else. But when that job got taken away from me, it, it rocked me like to the yeah. core. It was like my identity went out the window. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I remember the day I got the phone call, like that's when I hit my knees, which I think is really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I remember just sobbing on my kitchen floor, like, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? Who am I? You know, but at the same time, like, I also didn't recognize myself as, as like the person that I actually wanted to be in that role. I learned a ton. I did a ton. I got exposed to so much, which makes me a great business growth consultant. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, like I came out of undergrad with a theater and music degree <laughs> <laughs> and I was running like tech teams for PayPal, like something mm. didn't compute. Right? Like, I mean, I'm yeah. capable just because you can, doesn't mean you should kind of a thing. So I actually, and I, the more women I spoke to, the more I started hearing this theme of like, I checked all the boxes. Why am I not happy? What, what is happening? So I actually mm. named my, my company on paper is actually called create honesty because when I started out in my business, I wanted just that I wanted to rediscover me me as a new mom of two complicated kids, me as, you know, just a person aside from being a mom, as a wife, as all these different things. Um, and I started out by kind of trying to find my, this is going to sound really cheesy, how to find my humanity again, right? Because mm -hmm. I was so kind of programmed to just, everything had an agenda and always like be kind of cutthroat and stuff like that for my corporate life. Um mm -hmm. So I started off by, I was always coaching. I was always consulting. Like that's been an always thing, but I also did things like documentary screenings. I sold out documentary screenings with women on body image 
And Mm. I did a gratitude project with the community. Like I just wanted the things to find me again. Um, And I let that, and I was fortunate enough to let that happen while, you know, triaging all this other stuff for my kids. So, you know, I just, I went on kind of a self-discovery journey. Yeah. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Severance <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> corporate for that. Um, you know, and then I slowly, but surely built my business. And honestly, like my business has saved, has probably saved my life more so than anything else throughout this entire journey, because it's, it's me, it's an extension of me in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Um, and I think that's what a lot of, especially mom entrepreneurs have to remember that like, I told, I remember telling my husband, like, if my business goes under, I probably won't be able to forgive you. I probably won't be able to like count, like I won't be able to counter that resentment for everybody. Right. Because it was so mine. Interesting. Uh, And it's not that I'm attaching myself worth to it because it's not that kind of a thing, but it is something that's, that's me. And that is your cup. Yeah. It fills my cup. Exactly. And like, you, like, there are definitely parts that I hate, like, don't get me wrong, but I mean, nothing's going to be perfect. Like the bookkeeping maybe? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I outsourced. That was like one of the first things I outsourced. I was like, absolutely. I'm not touching that shit. Um, (laughs) But but there's so much I love, like seeing, seeing the aha moment on a woman's face when she realizes her power or, you know, watching her make the money that she actually deserves to make. Like those are things where I, you know, I have two boys. So I refer to this as kind of like my daughter (laughs) over here. Um, you know, so there's, it's been an interesting journey, but you know, and I've been involved with like women's anthology books that went to national bestsellers. I've done the podcast. I've had, I've been really fortunate mm-hmm. to be able to do so many amazing things and do them on my own terms, um, oh, I love which is that. worth a million dollars in itself. And then also, you know, yeah. be able to juggle like to me during this chapter of my life, Money is not my main goal. Money freedom. Is it a goal? Yes. Is it my main goal? No. Time freedom is actually more valuable to me than the money freedom. So I want the ability to be in control of my own schedule, be able to work when I want to work, things like that. Um, And I believe that you can make money and I think you can do both. Yes, Michelle, let's (laughs) just stop there and make sure that people don't think that we're saying that you get paid less because oh, you no, have no. flexibility. No. Because I think that a lot of women and some dads too, some men too, go into this um, you know, entrepreneurship or you know, starting their own business mm-hmm. with the idea that, well, you know, I have to trade off financial gain for, you know, flexibility. Yeah. Not true, people. No, not true. Not true. Not not true. true. As long as as long as you're focused in on it. I think to your point. I work with a lot of women who have really interesting thought patterns around money, Mm -hmm. right? Like they don't want to inconvenience anybody or they don't, you know, I had a conversation with a client this morning who is a special needs mom. And, you know, I had to have the conversation says your number one goal is to make money. And I don't mean to sound crass with that, but the more money you make, the more people you help. And that's how I approach it because that is true. The more money I make, the more people I help, the more people I help, the better my mission. Like it, it all kind of goes in one big circle, but by all means, I'm not willing to do it. If that means I can't pick my kids up from school, right. <laughs> like, I'm like, I set the boundaries, um, which is not, I don't, I don't want it to sound like it's super easy. Like you just snap your fingers and do it, no. but it is something to constantly work at and it is doable. And we are in a new age. This has been a ginormous decade for us, you know, yes. yeah. um, not just because of the pandemic, but technology has allowed yeah. us so much freedom yes. yeah. and we can deliver without having to work around the clock. Yes. You no, know? we can be efficient with the tools that we have and we can deliver service in a, in an authentic way. Oh, yeah. Audience, I hope you're loving this conversation as much as I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm loving so it. Jazzed. This is awesome. Yeah. But, you know, so we're we're moving into this whole balance conversation. And I just want to say up front, I don't believe in work-life balance. I don't either. For me, I call it work-life integration. Me too, friend. Me too. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So good. I'm glad we're on the same page about that. There's no balancing it. It's all about how you're integrating it. And I think that's a function of the new world that we're living in this decade. So how do you coach people on 
integration and balance. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more that like, you know, anytime somebody would ask me, especially in corporate, but I mean, also in entrepreneurship, like how's your balance? Like it always made me feel like I was like part of my French, but fucking something up. Yeah. Like it just, because balance is so like, you're either in it or you're out of it. And I was, chances are that I'm out of it. I don't know. Um, and it just, it was a word for me that really triggers me. Um, so I did move more towards integration and I do things like, you know, every Sunday I sit down and I don't brain dump just my business tasks that are coming for the week or just my life. I brain dump it all. And I allocate everything to its place. Like I plan holistically at all times. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking at how a kid's thing may impact a work thing or a work thing may impact a kid's thing. I'm always looking at the harmony and trying to kind of, you know, have them interchangeably balance, not balance, integrate with one another. Um, yes. But I'm always planning holistically around one another. I'm never, I'm never looking at things in silos. Um mm -hmm because that's not realistic as to how my life goes. I can't be planning client meetings without knowing what time my son's soccer game is. I can't yeah. do that. And that's one of the main things that I work with, especially with mom entrepreneurs is that, you know, oftentimes they are in like kind of segmented buckets, like, because we we're really good at compartmentalizing, right? We put right. our work hat on, we put our mom hat on, but what I did with my business is I don't want any client coming to my session and taking that mom hat off necessarily, unless she wants to. I want all the hats on all the time because mm -hmm. I think that they're beneficial to one another. And I think that you can leverage them accordingly and that they can help each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like my mom brain helps me a lot in business and my business brain helps me a lot in momming. So, so I true. all one big integration, but you, it does take a, a shift of your mindset to kind of view it that way. Absolutely. Talk to me about the difference between coaching and therapy. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question, friend. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I also, I also have like the distinction between co coaching and consulting as well. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, therapy, like, so it's interesting when COVID hit, I had a lot of clients that kind of like lost their minds because one, one in particular lost her business literally overnight. Mm -hmm. So she was suicidal. She was, you know, not in a good place. She was across the country. So it's not like I could just show up at her house. Um, mm -hmm. But I ended up working directly with her therapist. And I think that is the difference between coaching and therapy is that we need to be very careful about delving into psyche, right? Like mm -hmm. very careful about, you know, giving strategies around like mindset is one thing. Therapy strategies are another, right? So I walk a very fine line with those things as well as then you've got coaching versus consulting. Whereas I like to liken it to coaching is like showing the horse where the water is, whereas consulting is telling them how to drink. Right. So, and when it comes to that, the therapy is even deeper than that. Therapy goes even deeper. Cause I mean, I'm a big believer of having a therapist and a coach and a cons all the people. All the sports yes. team that you get. The whole team. All, all the, the team. Teams. The Avengers, are, as I like to call them, right? Like we I like call all... it our circle of care, but yes, you know, exactly. It's... Exactly. Um, so I don't know sure. if that answers your question fully, but that's just kind of my take on it. It does. It does. Because I get this question a lot because I have a coaching business, which I love. Yeah. I love it even more than being a lawyer because it allows me to explore possibilities with people rather than as a lawyer. I'm just telling you, okay, yeah. this is my advice. This is what we need yes. to do Yes. and making decisions and then doing the tasks to get there. Right. Still very important. People need that. Yeah. But the coaching is empowering for people. It is. It is. It's yeah. a relationship that empowers people with information, with tools, with, with support, with accountability. Yeah. You know, accountability yeah. is very important in coaching. Yes. Absolutely. And you know, I've had a business coach for many years and my business would not be where it is today without a business coach. Yes. Yeah. What is the um, first step? You know, many people come and listen to my podcast because I love to highlight people who have had an idea yeah. and, you know, created something from it, whether it's a product or a tool or a business or a program or something, right? Um how do people how, get how started? Do they do that? <laughs> yeah. How do people get started when they have an idea? Like uh, for me, you know, I went to school, I got licensed to be a lawyer. So not so creative. Right. Yeah. yeah. But what if I had an idea to, you know, 
develop these coaching programs like I did. Like, I think it would be so much better if I just did this for families or, yeah. or enhanced what I offer with this for families. How do people get started? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a really great question. There's so many different ways that I could take this. Um, but I think, you know, one of the first activities I run with clients, no matter what level they're in is like seven layers of why, I don't know if you're familiar mm-hmm. with that. Um, yeah. right. Or level lever. Some people call it levels. Some people call it layers. I interchange them all the time. Um, but I think like, I love that activity, which is essentially, you know, asking why seven times and getting to the actual crux of why you want to do something, because I think it's very, um, you're, you're going to need it. You're going to need to that. Why, especially on the really hard days when you're embarking Mm -hmm. on this journey. So I think that's number one, one of the, one of the things that I would run with people is understanding the, why the hell do you want to even do this? I had a woman the other day that I was speaking to who has, who has a, who has a full-time job, but now she has a side business and the side business has taken off gangbusters, which is fantastic. But now she's like, well, why am I even And her husband saying, well, why are you even doing this? We have a full-time gig already. And she's like, I don't know. Like, why am I doing this? You know, uh, why am I putting myself under this stress? And I think also entrepreneurship is not for the weak. So um, no, you have to be very, very clear. And I know it may sound a little cheesy and woo woo, but getting to that crux, I'd say once you get to like number five on the why, Mm -hmm. asking the why is that's when people really start going from their head to their heart and they can feel it. And then from that to flip it on its end too, you know, a lot of people will overlook the step of figuring out who your ideal client or customer is. Yes. Yes. All the time. They want to sell it to everyone or it's all women or it's all men or it's whatever it may be. And that is one of the main things that I stress with entrepreneurs before Mm -hmm. you go down the rabbit hole of trying to sell things and trying to jump into it. Who are you selling to? Because that's going to, that is going to really dictate what your social media tone sounds like. What's Mm -hmm. your website copy sounds like? Who are you marketing towards? How are you going to close that sale? You know, all of those different things. If you have not, I mean, you can Google and find an ideal client avatar worksheet, or I have one, I actually have one on my website. Um, for $20 that you can download an audio like podcast about it and get a worksheet and stuff from it. But if you haven't done something like that, how are you going to know who you're selling to? So you need to know why you're doing it and who you're selling to, and don't get it twisted that you still need to sell (laughs) Yes, no matter what it is. Cause people are like, I just want to, I just want to make an impact. And yes, you do, but you still need to sell friends. (laughs) Yes. And whether you decide that you're going to sell at the local farmer's market, yes. cool, cool, no problem with yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Or you want to have a huge internet online business. Those are different things. Yes, they so are. They really are. really important to think about that. And, you know, think about when you're asking yourself the seven whys, think about your toddler. <laughs> and when they would come to you with that, well, but why? And then exactly. you would answer, oh, but Why? That's yeah. what we're talking about. Yes. We dig yes. deep. We dig deep to find yes. out really what's what's behind all of this. You know, my why for the coaching programs and the the online education master classes that I have is to be reach people with the right information at the right time of their lives in an affordable way. Nice. That um is you know, non-confrontational and really is empowering for them. Thanks. So it took me a long time to get down to that, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, that was really hard to figure out, but now I know who my audience is because my audience is mainly families, somewhat individuals with disabilities. And also I do special things for professional groups as well. Yeah. So it just, it took a long time. I mean, I started almost two years ago, beta testing and doing all this. Now, Mm -hmm. if you're like me, and I will be honest, I have ADD. So I want everything right now. Like, (laughs) you know, I don't want to do all this, Michelle. I just wanted to come to fruition in front of me now. (laughs) Can't you just do this for me? Like, you know, give me a website. Let's go. I'm so good at talking to people. I can sell anything. It is not easy to really get things going, but it is amazingly worthwhile if it's the right thing for you. It is. And just remembering that it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what I tell myself all the time, especially on the bad days, especially, you know, there was a period of time when my son was in a flare that 
like I wasn't out farming for business and I felt it. Like I felt mm-hmm. it a couple months later, right? Because my pipeline dried up, you yeah. know, but then, you know, I have to remind myself I'm in the long game and that gives me a little bit of solace to say, okay, just because, you know, this speed bump, not roadblock is hitting right now. It doesn't mean that six months from now, it's not going to be different. Or, you know, it, it gave me a little bit of freedom to kind of think of it that way and not be like, oh my God, you know, shit's hitting the fan all over the place in the family. I can't focus on this right now. My business is going to go under and go into like, you know, spiral, it gave yeah. me a little solace to say, no, this is a long game and it's okay if this, if you go off the track a little bit here, as long as you don't stay off the track, that's my main, yeah. my main thing. You have to get back on the track. That's a really good point. Last year in 2023, I took what I call the sabbatical year and I talked about it on the podcast oh, nice. because I was getting burnt out yeah. and yeah. I needed a break and I needed to reassess you know, go back to basics and reassess because I've always been the girl who can't say no. Oh, you want me to be on this program? Okay. Okay. You want me to join this committee? All right. All right. You want me to be on this board? Okay. And I get it. There's so much need out there, but it, it just really was snowing me under and I needed to take a step back and fortify my business and just reassess, you know, where I was at. And what it did for me was it gave me an opportunity to, to, ha- to press that restart button and to think about, okay, so I've taken all these activities out of my life. What do I miss? Yeah. What people do I miss being with? Yeah. What yes. programs, what organizations, where do I miss being aligned? And I, I really got to narrow down how I wanted to spend my time because this work-life integration is tough. There's only so many hours in the day and we have to take care of ourselves, which is really the next thing I want to talk to you about because I know I'm going to run out of time. But um, (laughs) how how do we prioritize our own care as a caregiver? And if I hear one more time about taking the air, put it on yourself and then take, you know, the oxygen mask. That just doesn't apply to us. Okay. We have to have oxygen yeah. masks for everybody all, yes, the, freaking all the time, time. all the time. Um, but being in business, there's a lot of mental pressure Yes, and, right. or being a professional period, you know, mm-hmm. not just Agreed. having your own business, but being a professional, being successful, whatever you do, there's pressure whatever it is, whatever your chosen career is, whether it's, you know, working in retail or working in the food industry, doesn't matter. There's, there's so much pressure these days to be successful and to show up all the time for everybody that needs you. Mm -hmm. How do we do this, Michelle? Yeah. So the main thing that was popping into my head as you were, as you were speaking, because there's a lot of ways I could go with this question, um, is flexibility within the framework. So, and I think, you know, for me, I have a lot of non-negotiables that, that, Mm -hmm. that happened in my life, Um, you know, and I've learned what they are over time because if, if I don't do them, I am not showing up as as my best self as a caregiver, as my best self as a business person. So, you know, non-negotiables like, you know, there's a podcast I listen to every single day called the quote of the day show. I listen to it after I drop my kids off. It is a non-negotiable for me because it gets my head into the right space. Yes. Um, I've learned over the last like six or eight months that, you know, walking for me is non-negotiable mm-hmm. because if I don't, my mental space is not okay. Yeah. Right. So there's things like that. But when I say flexibility within the framework is that, you know, it's impossible for me to say, I'm going to walk every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at five o'clock. Like, yeah. I can't do something like that, or I'm going to attend a spin class at the same time every single week. That's not how I roll. I need the flexibility to be able to do that. And thankfully I'm an entrepreneur, so I can, I need the flexibility to be able to do it when I can do it. Because if I try Mm -hmm. to put myself in that pressure of, you know, hitting it the same time every single week or building the the framework so strict, my family's just going to blow that shit up anyway. (laughs) Yeah. There's no way of getting around it. So, I mean, flexibility within the framework, I create the framework. I know my non-negotiables and then I just make sure they happen, but I have 24 hours in the day to make them happen Mm -hmm. or I have seven days in the week to make them happen. Um, And, you know, and over time, I've also stopped, I've stopped beating myself up about it as much. I still do sometimes, Um, you know, but I, 
I've learned that, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily about motivation either. Like I don't have to feel motivated to go for a walk. I have to be dedicated to go for a walk um, because I know that my mental health will be better for it. So it's little things like that, like motivation. Yeah. Sometimes people say motivation versus discipline, which I go back and forth on that word discipline, but motivation versus dedication. I really mm -hmm. like, and I'm dedicated to making sure that I show up in the best way that I can for my family and for my business. So those are the things that need to happen in order for me to do that. I love that. Some people are going to listen to this podcast and say, but I can go to spin class every Monday, That's Wednesday, fine. Friday at about it. o'clock. Great. That's what you figured yeah. out. That, yeah, that that's works your, for that's you. your framework. That's your that's framework. Um, but giving us the, you know, the permission to say this needs to happen in a day, you know, I have 24 hours to get this done. Yes. You know, I, I love that. I have to say, I came to the self-care party very late, too late in life. And if I have a mission it is to relieve people of that learning curve that I yes, went through agreed, you know because agreed. it's really important that we take care of ourselves and that we do it in the way we want it's not like mm -hmm. oh go get your nails done take a bubble bath like yeah that, that stuff doesn't do it for me like it's I'm not I feel nothing not when I do everybody. that stuff. <laughs> and some people aren't going to be able to schedule that some people aren't going right. to be able to fit that in you know right. I, I started really small Michelle for me it was prayer which, you know, doesn't work for everybody, but does for yeah. me and walk in the dog. Yeah. Now I have two dogs. So walking both dogs. Yeah. Small, very I small. I always say 15 non-negotiable minutes a day for you. That's what I will tell people, especially if they're struggling to find the time. Because again, if you look at 24 hours, you've got to sleep, maybe eight would be great of those hours, <laughs> right? Like, I, you could, I mean, and That's sleep hilarious. is like a good thing to start with. Um, but then after that, like what 15 minutes, I don't care what you do in those 15 minutes, as long as yeah. there are, it's on your terms. Um, and I mean, start there and then build up from there, um, to your point of starting small, like it doesn't have to be this like huge undertaking of a thing, but something in our society has made us think like, if we're not, it's an all or nothing mentality, right? If we're not doing yeah. it all, then we're not doing it well. Um, for 15 minutes, you can get a lot of rejuvenation in 15 minutes, friend, right? You can, you can, most of us can. And I, I think I mentioned this on a recent podcast, but I've, I've talked about this a lot. It also took me a long time to learn this, but those 15 minutes are going to be so important to your kids. Don't think you're yes. taking that time no, away from them. No, your kids need to see what it means to be a happy adult. Yes, they do. Absolutely. You can't tell people to be happy. You have to show them. Yes. You yes. have to show them what it looks like to be happy, productive. Mm -hmm. well integrated you know it's all a modeling session yes, for your is. children it's so is that's so true I mean and it's not to say that it comes without the guilt like yesterday I came home and my my oldest was playing basketball with the driver and he wants me to play basketball with him I'm like and I had to say no I'm going for a walk because I know again I will be a much more pleasant mom if yeah. I go for the walk and to your point, I was modeling, no, this is something that I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to break this promise to me because I don't want him breaking his promises to him right. to himself when he's older either. Right. Um, and we understand that for our kids. We just don't get yeah, it for get ourselves. It for us. Yeah. Yeah. It's taken a while, but I think, I, I think maybe I'm starting to, starting yes. to get it at least today. Who and this is more. another thing that you have to practice people and you're not going to get it right all the time, right away. All the practice you know, you for a reason. Yes. And it's, I, I think I read recently, um, I can't remember where, I'm sorry, about <laughs> our our kids, our adult kids. So this generation coming up, um, more so me than yours, is that they're not having kids because we haven't modeled for them what it looks like looks to like, be a happy parent. Yeah. You know, they see yes. us and how miserable we've been while we were raising them and everything was so hectic all the time and we could never yeah. get everything right. And it was so hard. We should not be modeling. Parenting is so hard. Why would our kids want to do it? You know, no, I think, they... or how about like, we can do hard things. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. How about we pull that in a little bit? Like, yes, it can be hard, but it can also be amazing. Like two things can be yeah. true at the same time, but just yeah. don't go heavy on the hard. On when right. you're modeling, go make sure that you're, you know, you are kind of showing all the different sides of the coin, 
when you're doing it because it's an amazing, amazing journey. Um, but yeah, it's hard, but that's life. Like it's right. both. It's hard and beautiful at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Michelle is basically outlining for you a different paradigm yes. for, you know, how to be a successful entrepreneur, parent, et cetera. Right. I mean, this, yeah. this is really a new way of seeing what it means to be successful. Yes. And also, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention like defining what your definition of success is, right? We've talked about, you know, schedule, we've talked about self-care, we've talked about all those things, but you know, one of the main things that you need to answer is what do you want? What do you want it to look like? You know, and not be a, because when I ask people what they want, I kind of get a deer in headlights look sometimes, especially for And I think it's because we forgot that we can actually answer that question. Yes, there's life contracts and obligations and stuff like that, but there are pockets in the day that you can get what you want and that you, but you need to design that with intention, especially if you're an entrepreneur and especially if you're a caregiver, like take, take the ownership of that and design it with intention so that Mm -hmm. you actually get what you want when you, when you say it. So good. That's so good. I love it. Okay. I'm out of time. I hate, I hate when this happens. I could talk for hours with you. Me too. Final, final last word or final tips for parents who are trying to do this or who are trying to do it all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the main thing I want to say is that you're not doing it wrong. I think that's one thing I always want to remind people because I think a lot of parents think like, oh, it must be me. I must be doing this wrong. That's why it's Mm -hmm. so hard. Um, it's hard because it's fucking hard <laughs> to be blunt. Like, sorry, I swear a lot. Um, <laughs> but you're a truck driver. I know. I'm like, but, but that's why it's hard. It's hard because you're doing hard things. It's not hard because something's wrong with you. So I think that's like the main, mm. the last main thing I want to drive home with people is it took me a long time to realize I wasn't broken or I wasn't just like parenting wrong. And that's what was the problem. It took me a while. And I, and I still have to realize it on bad days that it's just, it's hard because it's hard and you're doing hard things every single day. And you're running a marathon that not a lot of people have run and maybe people don't understand. Um, so you're maybe, you may be running that marathon alone, right? Mm. Uh, Which is why things like this podcast and your community and things like that exist, Because, you know, the more you surround yourself with people running a similar marathon, the more you realize it's not you, it's the situation. And then you can figure out what you can control and what you can't control in that situation. Hmm. Oh, this has been such a great talk. So for everybody that wants to reach out to Michelle, we will have all her contact information in our show notes, but especially you want to go to her website at michellamercier.com. And again, we'll have that all in our show notes. Um, this has been a great talk. Thank you yeah. so much. I'm so like rejuvenated. I know, me too. This, this is awesome. You. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it was so great. Thanks. Bye, Michelle.